In the wake of deadly violent crime, families and friends of the victims experiencing perhaps the worst moment of their lives. Like the grind that opened up and my baby disappeared. And I was hoping, praying that it wasn't him. The pain of that loss made worse. New from overnight, a Macon man is dead after a shooting on Linwood Drive. By news coverage. You're listening to the news, the news constantly reporting my son's death. Journalists simply reporting the facts. That was their job. They had to do that. But sometimes contributing to the pain. Within two hours of me finding out, I'd received five phone calls. Which may discourage families from speaking out or even sharing memories of their loved ones. Sometimes reducing those lost. 16th homicide. 21st homicide. This is Macon's first homicide of 2023. To simply a number. Reporting on violent crimes is difficult. Sudden, tragic deaths impact families and communities for days, months, even years. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Frank Malloy. And I'm Lori Johnson. Over the next half hour, we'll be sharing with you a new approach in how 13 WMAZ will try to report violent crimes and tragedies. It's an initiative called More Than a Number, aimed at giving a face to the victim and a voice to the family. Families like that of 20-year-old Kadarius Porter. He loved video games, friends, and his family. Someone shot and killed him on February 25th of this year. Investigators told his mom, Jessica Jackson, he was not the target. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. That gun blast killed Porter and shattered his mom's world. This is how most of us found out about 20-year-old Kadarius Porter's death. New 9-11, the Bibb County Sheriff's Office says they're investigating how a man died on Greer Street. Deputies found 20-year-old Kadarius Terrell Porter unresponsive with a gunshot wound to the head. His mom, Jessica Jackson, received a call from a family member with the news and remembers heading to the hospital. And I was hoping, praying that it wasn't him, but I was able to recognize that it was him, realize that it was him when they lifted his foot up to put him on the scratcher after visiting the crime scene on Greer Street. And I went to the hospital and waited in the emergency room. Everybody, I actually let myself in because I worked there. And when I got to the job, they let me in. And they put me in a quiet room. The moments that followed were filled with grieving family, heartbroken doctors, and investigators trying to figure out what happened and why. Jackson says investigators knew one thing. That Kadaris was a victim of a crime that wasn't meant for him. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jackson believes it started with an issue on social media that spilled out into the real world with real consequences and could possibly be gang related. Was Kadaris in a gang? Not that I know of. You know, because he, you know, most of the kids that, you know, um, young men that are in gang, they wear like one basic color. Cadaver's wore all colors. And she says he was welcomed everywhere. So far, the case is unsolved. It does get frustrating at times. It does. It really does. But I still just pray and um, think positive. Jackson says investigators have been very helpful and keep the lines of communication open. 13 WMAZ didn't reach out to talk to Jackson in February when her son was killed, but she says she wasn't ready to talk then, but she is now. It's a lot of hurting mothers out here, a lot of broken families. The crime is not going unnoticed. Our children do matter. Every victim does matter. That's why, as journalists, we have a duty to cover stories like Porter's. It's our job to let people know what's happening in their neighborhoods. Our coverage can help solve crimes and bring attention to problems. But we also know that coverage can intensify the pain for victims' families and friends. And sometimes the sheer number of violent crimes can cause the community to lose sight of the victims themselves. That's why we want to show that each victim is more than a number. No one in our newsroom knows that better than Justin Baxley, our digital content manager. Someone shot and killed his father nearly six years ago. Suzanne Lawler shares Justin's story and how it inspired him to develop this new approach to reporting on victims of tragedies. I mean, me and my mom coming here. Michael Baxley took the next generation, his son Justin, to this spot, the Fishport 2. He told me about the dock sauce and how it was the best sauce in the world. Justin says his dad would have done anything for him, 
and anybody else, too. Robbery was the motive. Someone shot Michael Baxley in the fall of 2017, then left him to die. Crime scene tape went up, the coroner gave us a soundbite, and journalists blew up Justin's phone. Within two hours of me finding out, I'd received five phone calls asking for interviews. And I would say, I'm not ready yet, and they'd call back an hour later, are you ready now? Lights, microphones, trauma. How can anyone be ready? And it was about, there was a lack of empathy and a lack of compassion for what I had gone through. And it was about, you know, I had to be beholden to their 24 hour news cycle. Justin didn't talk to us. He didn't talk to anyone. He says he shut down. And when you think this story can't get much worse for him or other crime victims, it does. Investigators called the scene off Fall Avenue gruesome, and nobody came in to wash away all of that blood. So me and my cousin got down and, and the investigator, we cleaned it ourselves. As journalists, we added to Justin's grief, and the truth of it is, it happens every day. But Justin, he took that big ball of darkness, grief, and pain, and turned it into something incredible. The media and homicide victims can interact in a way that the family now controls that interaction. Justin received a fellowship from Pointer Institute, which is a journalism think tank. He laid out a better way for us to do business. Send out a resource guide. He presented a roadmap to us, law enforcement and community leaders. Sergeant Coleman Lewis is still working his dad's case and calls all of this providence. He has come up with this program to create a sense of humanity. Justin can't sit and have a sandwich with his dad anymore, but Michael Baxley's spirit lives inside his son and that same generous personality. And we think he'd be pretty proud. I like to think so. Suzanne Lawler, 13 WMAZ News. Justin says he wishes he had talked to the media after his father's murder. He believes if he had shared his father's story in the days after his death, someone with information might have come forward. Justin is still waiting for justice, but he also wants to help others. He created more than a number to ease the pain and bridge the gap after violent crimes and tragedies. It starts with an online form that victims, families, and friends can fill out when they're ready. We want to give them a chance to talk about their loved one in a less intrusive way. We hope it gives families more control. Here's how. When family or friends are ready, they can tell us about their loved one share memories, and upload photos. They can also let us know if they're willing to talk on camera with a reporter to tell their loved one's story. Yes, no, and not at this time are all acceptable options. And they can let us know an appropriate time to contact them when and if they're willing to talk. We'll use answers and photos we get from these forms to create a memorial page. It'll live on our website always to honor those we've lost. And we're hopeful it could also help solve some cases that are still open. Baldwin County investigator Major Scott Deason says they're limited in what they can share. We're not always able to reveal specific details of the crime because more often than not, only the perpetrator knows some of these details and we don't want to always let uh, the offender know what law enforcement knows. But when you make it known the actual crime or what it what had occurred, uh, it, it may hit home for some people and it, and it may be, make it more personal to them the way they do want to help solve it. The form will live on our website. You can also text the word MORE to the number on your screen, 478-752-1309, and we can send that link right to your phone. We'll need help to spread the word about the online form and change the approach to covering crime. That's why we turn to law enforcement crime prevention organizations, schools, nonprofits, and prosecutors who work with the families of violent crime victims. We presented more than a number to them in early July. We asked for their ideas about how we've reported crime in the past and how to humanize our approach. Frederick Price talked with two leaders about crime coverage in our community. I want to curb the violence. Deborah Jackson works with Resilient Middle Georgia. Training adults to help them recognize trauma in children. A challenge she faced as a child. If we would have had this early on, a lot of issues that I deal with and other people deal with as adults, we wouldn't have these issues. 
And those problems, she believes, range from violence to not having the resources to deal with everyday life. Trauma, trauma is a major issue. It's very expensive to be traumatized and not have help. But when violent crimes do happen, oftentimes those details aren't discovered until later. As journalists, we can only report what we know. And without information, that can impact how viewers look at our news coverage. All these young men and women. Frank Dixon works with Cure Violence Macon, a group focusing on crime prevention. They meet here in Pleasant Hill. He and Deborah both feel people are simply desensitized to the violent crimes on the news. If we're going to give all the bad news, we've got to have offset it with some good news or, or help with the healing process. A lot of the media coverage, Frank believes, is negative. But this could change, he adds, by simply going beyond the numbers. Last year we had 70 homicides. But what's the status of those homicides? How are the families faring? You know, how, are the, how is the community healing? which could make a difference in how this community views the stories we share. You ought to be honest on what's going on, but you don't want to make people think that this is the end. As for Deborah, she says adding a face with a name would grab the attention more than a number ever could. It could really help to know this was a grandmother or this was somebody's grandfather or son uh, and he's been taken too soon. And maybe those who are committing the crimes, she tells me, might just understand how much harm they're doing to families and the community. Frederick Price, 13 WMAZ News. The feedback we received about more than the number from our community partners was positive, and many agreed to help us get it off the ground. But we don't just need their help. We need yours as well. We talked to Warren Selby, board chair for Macon Regional Crime Stoppers. He says the best way to both prevent and solve crime is to get people engaged. It doesn't matter whether you live in southeast, north, or west Macon, or central Georgia, uh, throughout all central Georgia, you want to live, work, and play in a safe community. And so that's why it's important to have citizens be engaged and be vigilant and be alert of what happens in your neighborhood and certainly hold people accountable for their actions. To get the word out, we're starting with business cards like these. We're giving a stack to law enforcement organizations, nonprofits, and other Central Georgia leaders. When a crime happens, they'll hand these cards out to people in crisis, something physical to hold on to. They can scan the QR code right away or when they're ready to reach out. The link leads to our online form and other resources. He will be 50 years old. This Macon mother lost her son 30 years ago. Still facing the anniversary of his death hasn't gotten any easier. Camila Williams talked to her about coping with the pain. That story when more than a number continues plus. After a loved one's death, it's hard to figure out what comes next. From cleaning up the crime scene to funeral expenses, we'll walk you through resources available to victims' families. As we go to break, please take a look at your screen. These are the names of people who were killed in Central Georgia just this year. They were taken from family, friends, and a community that loved them. When someone loses a loved one to a crime or a tragic accident, the grieving process can take many different forms. Camila Williams talked with one mom who buried her son almost 30 years ago and says one day is the hardest to get through. Every year, August 15th doesn't get easier for Faye Alexander. That is going to be one of the hardest days of my life. That's going to be a grieving day for me. Her son, Cusell Walker, would be 50. But as that day leave, and go to August the 16th, I'll be fine. June 23rd, 1994, Alexander is still in disbelief about what happened to her son. And I called the young lady first, and she said, Miss Faye, we've been trying to get in touch with you all day to tell you Cusell got shot, and I hollered. What she describes as a bad dream, a moment that wasn't real, even when it was on TV. You're listening to the news, the news constantly reporting my son's death. And that wasn't good, but that was their job. They had to do that. The mother of three mourned the loss of a son. Her grief led to thoughts of revenge. And I need to get out because I got some work to do. Cause so help me God, they was either going to kill me or I kill them. She saw a grief counselor. 
I went once a week, but it was not helping me. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Because I felt if I leave your office, I should feel some kind of relief. Franchetta Trawick is a grief counselor at Piedmont Macon. She says grief is different for everyone. A lot of times the immediate response is, is fear, numbness, and denial. You just can't seem to believe that this is happening. Trawick says seeing a professional should be the first step, but there are other ways. Finding a support group a grief counselor, which is very important because you have a safe place. You have a place where there are other people who have experienced loss. They found it here as the National Director of Peacekeepers Healing of Affliction, a place where parents find support after the death of a child. You're dealing with someone that has been through what you've been through. And when you can bring the outlook or what God is giving you to say, it brings strength to that person. Faith finds her strength in remembering the good times with Cusell. I remember one time he was trying to show this man, this man asked him for direction and took his concert ticket. My child came, he said, Ma, I got robbed today. I said, thank God for your life. A memory she goes back to because he was still here, but the grief won't be easy every August. And I sit here as I tell you that I'm good now. But come August the 15th, I won't be good. I won't be good. When a tragedy strikes, people closest to the victim may be in shock, simply trying to process what happened. They don't know where to turn. That's why, with the help of our community partners, we have created an online resource guide. The resource guide offers information about immediate needs of family members. Did you know some companies offer cleaning services specifically for crime scenes? Homeowners insurance may even cover the cost. Whenever someone dies, even if it's not from a crime, there's a lot of paperwork to handle. You'll find suggestions on how to check on benefits that may be available to you. We'll also connect you to the Georgia Crime Victims Compensation Program, where you can access forms needed for everything from an application for benefits to employment verification for the victim and more. We will walk you through the Victim's Bill of Rights. That's to make sure you know what information investigators and prosecutors should be sharing with you as the case moves forward. You'll find the resource guide on 13WMAZ.com, or you can text the word MORE to 478-752-1309. It's almost like a scene off the TV that you see when everything's going so fast and people are driving up and everybody's coming from everywhere. The night Shy Daniels was shot while sitting at home with her brother still feels like a nightmare for her family. The headlines have faded after 11 years, but her family says they're still fighting for answers. Next, we share what they went through and the struggles they still face. As we go to break, we continue to remember the victims of violent crimes taken from our community too soon. These are the names of people we lost in 2022. Please take a moment to think of them and remember them as more than a number. Thank you for staying with us. As we continue more than a number, our effort to give a face to victims of violent crime and a voice to their families. While headlines fade over time for families of victims, life changes forever. Caitlin Heck spoke with two families still searching for answers and for justice. Like the grind that opened up and my baby disappeared. She had been shot right behind her, I guess, earlobe in the head. Two different families, two different tragedies, but the same thing keeping them going all these years later. So the only thing you can have is hope, faith, and love. 25 years ago, Veronica Pate's eight-year-old daughter, Shy Shy, disappeared from their home in Unadilla. And for two years, I slept in a chair beside my door without locking it, thinking that she would walk back in. 18-year-old Shy Daniels died 11 years ago when a bullet came through her making home as she sat with her younger brother, Chris. You know, we were worried about Shy, and we got detectives walking around and police. I did lie detective tests. They came inside my house. They put all the stuff in. They 
took her book bags, some of her clothes, you know, stuff, and they went through all our prison stuff. The chaos eventually calmed, but life was far from normal. And like everywhere I went through high school, I got my first job, just everywhere. Ever while I was still. I am true the kid who was in a room when his sister got killed. Daniel's family, with a hole in their home and their hearts, was left to plan a funeral. She went even two weeks graduated from Central High School, which had been great. You know, her funeral was there. They, they had the, the funeral there. They did a scholarship for her, you know, in Shy Daniel's name. Both families have since put away or donated their loved ones' things, but they refuse to pack up their quest for answers. Because I want to keep my story right there, however long it takes. For me to find her. Though each media interview, anniversary, and balloon release stirs up the pain left behind, it also serves as a symbol of hope that one day they'll get their answers. I'm not going to never give up. I'm never going to stop believing. Caitlin Heck, 13 WMAZ News. Shai Daniels' family says they still have the bullet hole in their home and they refuse to fix it until her killer is arrested. Meanwhile, Veronica Pate says she still talks with investigators about finding her daughter and plans a celebration this October on her daughter's birthday. We want this project to bring more attention to cases like the Pates and the Daniels, long after the headlines, and we hope the effort can aid in finding some answers. Leaders at the Pointer Institute think so as well. They're a widely acclaimed and highly honored nonprofit organization dedicated to journalism and to training journalists. Eventually, we hope to expand the scope of more than a number. Benet Wilson with Pointer thinks it can go far. This can be used in any newsroom. It can be used for a print newspaper, an online publication, television, radio, podcast, um, social media. I mean, all of these platforms can be used to tell these stories and to tell them in a more compassionate and humane way, but also giving people the information that they need to understand what happened. Remember, you can find all of the resources online in our section called More Than the Number. That includes our victims memorial page and the form for families. We hope More Than the Number will help bridge the gap between journalists and families and also help our communities remember victims in a meaningful way. If you know someone who has lost someone, please point them toward our resources. We know we won't always get this right, but it's important that we try. If you missed any part of our More Than a Number special or need a refresher, you can watch it on demand right now on 13WMAZ+. Download the app now on Roku or Amazon Fire TV and stream at your convenience. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lori Johnson. And I'm Frank Beloy. Good night.